Welcome to another edition of the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley and I'm back with my fellas Dave Archer and DJ Shockley and fellas we get to talk about some actual action on the field and I'm not talking about preseason action I'm talking about regular season action the Atlanta Falcons they end up dropping their season opener to the Philadelphia Eagles 32 to 6 yes that's not the start that we all looked for and we'll dive into all of that but Say hello to the fellas. DJ, how are you doing, my man? Hey, Rack, man. It's always, uh, like I mentioned, great to be on with you guys every single week. And I'm glad we got some football to talk about. Obviously, uh, not in the fashion we want, uh, not having a W, but uh, hey, man, I'm here. I'm glad. I'm excited and good to see you fellas. Hey, Arch, we will talk about some positives and negatives that came out of the game, but uh, I know you got a chance to be back up in the booth. You saw the action. You went back and watched it again. And, but you know what? It's still exciting to talk about some regular season football. Yeah, no question about it. And this was a, a very important weekend for our country. 9-11, of course, was Saturday. Uh, the NFL rolled out the carpet and really did a phenomenal job of honoring those we lost, almost 3,000 lives we lost that day uh, in at 9-11. And, and then their tribute to those people, the tribute to the families that still have to endure and have to go through that. Uh, but I thought the national anthem, which they played simultaneously all around the league, so it was the dope. same national anthem. Super dope. It was phenomenal with the background of the of the first responders and all the people that were there that day and tried to save lives, did save lives, and it ultimately may have lost their lives as well. But just a really cool tribute, and it's – it's just another reminder that the NFL gets it and really does an amazing job with those type of situations. Yeah, that's a great point, Dave. I think that all the situations that we've had, I mean, I think about in my last 20 years since I entered the league in 2000, all the way up through now, the NFL does an outstanding job with with situations like this. Unfortunately, uh, some of them have a negative tone, but boy, do they find a way to make it positive and, and really shed some, some good light on it and, and really get people to think and remember about what happened uh, in our country 20 years ago. So uh, it's a great point there, Arch. All right, here's the rundown for this show. We will get some um, initial reactions to the game this past weekend. We will dive into it a little bit more. We'll talk about some new faces, but some of the same issues that we saw in previous years. And then me and DJ and Arch will get into a little bit of story time and, and kind of reflect <laughs> on our own careers on whether or not we had some good or bad opening week games. Um, and then we'll kind of spin it forward to some of the bigger surprises uh, that we saw throughout the, the league this uh, this past weekend. And then, of course, we'll take a look ahead next week um, and dive into that matchup a little bit more. But first of all, let's go ahead and get some quick reactions to this game. And Arch, I'm going to go right back to you again. This is kind of like a 30-second to a one-minute synopsis of what you saw on the field uh, this past weekend in the loss to the Eagles. Yeah, really not going to take me long here, Rack. I thought that there was a, an outstanding beginning to this thing. There are some really good positive you can take out of this. I know the Falcon fan is not going to look at it that way. 32-6 is all you ultimately see, and that's really all you ultimately should take in. But there are some things that you can look at that I think are building blocks, but ultimately not good enough. Yeah, and DJ, what are your kind of initial reactions after you saw the game? I mean, it got off to a great start, but then the finish wasn't so good. But what were some of your initial reactions coming away from the game? Uh, the first thing was this is game one. Uh, a lot of people expected – I think a lot in this first game as with a new staff, a bunch of new faces, a lot of things going on inside this organization. Everybody expected game one to just be blown out the water and you're scoring all these points and stopping everybody. It takes time. And I think it's if you watch football, if you understand how this works, it's going to take time for guys in certain spots, coaches to understand what guys can do. And I think it's something that we – I don't think fans should overblow about it just being, hey, you lost 32-6. to six. Yeah, that matters. The way you play matters. But it's game one. You got 16 more chances to get this thing right. And knowing Arthur Smith, he's going to find a way to get these guys playing at a higher level. And, you know, it's just week one. And uh, I think we'll be better going into next week. You know, guys, I, I know if we go back, shoot, it was probably four or five months to a previous podcast that we did, and it was shortly after we got a new general manager and head coach, and I think some of the media was a asking those guys, do you see this as a rebuild or a team that's wet, ready to win right now? And that's a difficult question to answer when you're a new head coach and a general manager because you want people to believe that you know what you're doing and that you're mm. going to get this team to win right away. But to DJ's point – it's not always like that. It's not like you can bring in a new GM, a new head coach, and so many new faces 
and go ahead and just blow out your first opponent. So you're right, DJ, I agree with you. It is the first week of the season. There is a lot of football left. But on the flip side, that's definitely not the result that the head coach, the general manager, or sure. any of those 53 guys on that active roster expected from this past weekend. So, yeah, they learn from it. They put their tape on. They put the tape on, um, and then they just get better. But um, let's dive into it a little bit more because you know we need to kind of dissect it a little bit. We talked about it coming into the season. New head coach, new general manager, new schemes. We had the number four overall pick, drafted arguably the most athletic and best tight end that we've seen in I don't know how many years, but yet we ended up losing 32-6. to six. So, DJ, I'm going to come right back to you. Let's expand in this a little bit more in some of the things that you saw that contributed to this loss, but maybe some also some optimism that you saw from the game as well. You know what, I, I think me and Arch and Recky as well, we were talking about before we came on, and Arch had a chance to talk to Coach, and, you know, I love to get his, you know, you know, his take on what Coach says, and I think the number one thing he talked about, and the one thing I think we've seen from day one is the attention to detail, but also being disciplined. And I think when you turn on the tape or you watch this game, there were moments in the game where the Falcons were not disciplined enough. And you're talking about little things as far as procedural stuff that happens pre-snap. And that's not something that you look at it and say, okay, this is the reason why you lost the game, but it's a part of it. But it's also a big part of you becoming a better football team is not putting yourself in those bad spots, not putting yourself in first and long or second and long or having a positive play. And then it turns around and you have a holding penalty or you have something that happens pre-snap that forces you to not be able to, to stay on track, especially offensively. So some of those things, you look back on the game, you say, okay, those things hurt you. Those things are, are, are part of the ball game that you want to absolutely clear up, and you got to find ways to do it. But positively, I think about – Arch talked about when we first came on is you start the game off and you look really good offensively. I mean, you're, you're distributing the ball all over the place. You run the ball. I think you have 86 yards in the first quarter of rushing the football. That is what I think everybody expected to see was the multiplicity in his offense to be able to do a lot of things. I mean, you talk about the first play of the game – and it looks like just a routine completion to Calvin Ridley, but you come out in that 22 personnel where you got two tight ends, you got both backs in the backfield, and it looks like, hey, we can run the football. It looks like a, a power formation, but you end up play action. It. You get your, your tight ends sitting on the backside. You have a tight split by Calvin Ridley. Here comes a nice big completion to start the ball game. You're aggressive. Those are things that you can build on because you can see what you can do with this kind of offense, with these type of players in these type of situations. So there's tons to build on, especially on both sides of the ball. But I think the biggest thing I take away is the, the attention to detail of some of the things you do pre-snap that hurts you when you're trying to get your, a drive started or trying to get your team into a better spot. Yeah, DJ uh, just talked about some of the positives. And Arch, let's just let's kind of go down that same line because before we came on, you went back and you watched the tape and you said, you know what, there was some really good things that came out of it. So why don't you tell us some of the things that you saw either when you called the game initially or when you went back and looked at the tape that's showing you some promise from, from this point on? Well, in particular, we knew Philly coming in was really good up front. Their defensive front is probably as good as there is across the league. Not saying they're the best, but they're certainly in the conversation. It's a team that had 49 sacks a year ago. They were salty against the run. So you wanted to come out and you wanted to establish the run game. Shock mentioned the opening play. I thought that was a nice little ice breaker to say hey wait a minute we're not just going to run it we're going to throw it got Ridley the football and so now let's go run the football and they came off the ball I saw a tape where a number of players Jalen Mayfield Matt Hennessy uh, Chris Lindstrom those interior three who I think ultimately are going to be the keys to whether you're going to be able to move the football both through the air and on the ground the interior three offensive linemen had Fletcher Cox Javon Hargrove Hassan Ridgeway had him eight 10 yards off the ball, blowing them off the ball, where Cordero Patterson and Mike Davis were finding cutback lanes, running the football. Shock talked about 80, the 86 yards the first quarter. They had 110 yards rushing at halftime. Okay, you're on your way to a 200-yard day, and <laughs> we know that if you lay 200 yards on somebody on the ground in a game, you have kicked their rear end. Yeah. Now, it didn't get there. And Philly made some adjustments, which is part of the negative where you've got to figure out, don't let that change, the, the equation change in the second half. But when you start talking about the things you want to do and the capabilities, 
You have the capability to do that. Red zone deficiencies reared their ugly head again. You talked about Shet Rack, some of the things, some of the same problems we've had in the past. That's a problem we've had in the past. Part of it had to do with the lack of attention to detail. Lined up wrong on a on a on a uh, formation. Jumped offside. All of a sudden, you're back. You back up against the chains. Those are things you have to eliminate. But if you're looking for stuff to hang your hat on, go back and look at the first half of this game. This game with nine seconds to go in the first half is seven to six. Mm. That's what the score was in the game. And you look up, it's 32-6. You think, what the hell happened? We got our rear ends kicked. Yeah. This was a game through the half, and you let it get away from you in the second half. Some because of Philly made some adjustments. And number two, the quarterback for Philadelphia was a difference in the game. Yeah, and, and I'll just chime in on a couple of little things that I saw, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Um, the things that I liked is you guys talked about Mike Davis and Cordero Patterson. I saw some flashes that there's something to be excited about, that this running game for the Atlanta Falcons is going to be – in probably in good, better shape than it's been the last couple of years. You saw some explosiveness, and obviously you got some speed with the changeup of Patterson. And I like that with the intent that Mike Davis runs. Obviously, yeah. he's a bigger, strong bat. He's going to run people over, but he's also got the quickness to kind of skate through some holes. So when he did see those, he took advantage, and you guys talked about it. They ran the football pretty well, and I think that there's some promise for the rest of the year. Here's what I didn't care for. The inconsistencies on the line of scrimmage. And I'm not going to say offensively or defensively. I'm going to say both of them. There was just too many times where it was like, good play, good play, bad play, pocket collapsing, got to get rid of the football. Yeah. Good play, defense, bad play, way too many yards, way too many yards. Uh, Jalen Hurts getting outside of the pocket, picking up a first down, it looked too easy, right? It didn't, he didn't even really get touched until he went out of bounds. And I think a lot of that starts up front. Uh, granted, that's the that's that's the benefit that you have when you have a mobile quarterback. He's got the ability to get outside the pocket, extend plays, pick up first downs. But I feel like that's going to have to get shored up if the Falcons are going to take the next step, spe specifically on the defensive side of the ball. So we talked a little bit about the good and the bad. Let's take a step back here, guys. And Arch, I want to go to you. We're going to do a little story time here. We're going to talk about maybe some of the worst opening week situations that we've had maybe it's been in the pros <laughs> arch college, like a couple or of even those. back to high school so i hope you've thought about yeah, it a little bit arch but i thought way give too me much one about of it memories <laughs> of, of, a, <laughs> of a week one that you kind of wish you forgot but we're going to make you remember it right now well as it turns out uh the falcons opening day loss today or the this weekend was the worst since 1987 which is a game I played in against Tampa. No. And we got our rear ends handed <laughs> no. to us. Steve DeBerg threw for 335 and five touchdowns, and oh. we've got blown out by Tampa down in Tampa to start the season off. I'd like to say that season ended well. It did not. We did not get much better <laughs> as the season went along. I can go back to college, opening game of the my college, my senior year. Chuck Long and the Iowa Hawkeyes come to town. Uh, they blow us out. We got uh. ripped there. And the season didn't – we got about – we were 500, I think, that year. I will say that high school, we lost to a team that we could never beat in high school. Preston High School in little <laughs> southeastern Idaho beat us down 28-6. to six. We came back and won every game after that and made it into the playoffs. Now, we didn't go win the whole thing, but we made it into the playoffs, so we did not let – so I had to go all the way back to high school, Dang. back to find a good memory <laughs> about getting my butt kicked in the opening <laughs> game, but I found one. <laughs> well, there it is, Falcons fans. There it is. You heard it. Sometimes uh, you got to go back to high school, but you can come out on the wrong side of the opening game, and you can still get back to the postseason. So there's the promise, DJ. I know you won a lot of games at Georgia, so maybe maybe it's not going to be your college. Yeah, it ain't going to be that rack. It ain't going to be that rack. The dogs are good. <laughs> <laughs> your turn. Oh, uh, but well, first off, Arch, I'm sorry. I was still rearing their ugly head in 2021 to the to the Cyclones. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but uh, I really have, like you mentioned, I didn't have many in college. I uh, didn't have many in high school, but I did have one my second year here with the Falcons. Archie will remember this really well. 2007, uh, we go on the road to Minnesota. Uh, we end up losing this game 24-3. AP uh, rushes for 100 yards in the game. He has like a 60-yard touchdown. It was his first game of yes. his career. Yes, he bought it. We had – um, my man Joey Harrington was was the quarterback at the time. He got sacked like six times. <laughs> uh, we, we we had a couple of interceptions in the game. Both of them went for pick sixes. It was just not a good day. And uh, to Arch's kind of point, we didn't really end the season pretty well. 
We ended up seven and nine that year. I think everybody remembers what happened uh, that year when our coach uh, leaving us and all that. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of that year, uh, we did draft a guy who is still putting up numbers to this day, which is Matt Ryan. So uh, obviously, that season led to us getting uh, the franchise guy and my man Matty Ice. So uh, boy, that is a great <laughs> spin on that. Now like, we had a horrible year, so we could yeah. get Matt Ryan yeah. third overall. That is that is positive <laughs> it belly was, right there. It was not a uh, it was not the year we wanted, but I guess from an organizational standpoint, <laughs> it worked out pretty well that we got Matt. Uh, obviously, that meant I wasn't going to play anymore because you know they paid man a lot of money and he was the guy uh so i just had to make sure i find my way on the backup part but it, it was fun though man it was good i mean that was a a tough day for us rack uh obviously not a good day i can't wait to hear the worst day of your first ever bring it rack you know, let's it's go interesting because because i was with atlanta for the in the early 2000s and 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 arch can tell you i mean dj you were still in college at this time but like we were okay you know it was like we had some losing seasons. We went to the playoffs a couple of times, but I had to go back and look at it because I'm not like a personal statistician, so I don't remember all these things. But I actually went four and two in my six years with Atlanta in opening games. Now, granted, we only went to the playoffs a couple of times, but still four and two is pretty good. And Arch might remember this, but there was a, a year is 2001, and I'm going to give you the date. And obviously, people are going to understand it's September 9th, mm. 2001. I think everybody knows what happened a couple days after that. But we went out to San Francisco, and we were playing the 49ers, and we were up 13-3 to going into the fourth quarter. And if I tell you we lost the game, that kind of tells you how it goes. They ended up tying it up in the fourth quarter. We went to overtime. They kick a field goal. We end up losing the game 16-13. to And any time you're winning going into the fourth quarter <laughs> after you had to travel all the way across the country oh, that's a bad and you ride. come back empty-handed, <laughs> you're not in a good – because you've got a five-hour flight that you've got to reflect on how you lost the game oh. in the fourth quarter, and nobody's happy. Yeah, Coaches get up to use the bathroom, and they're not even making eye contact <laughs> when they look at people. That's it's a long flight. Oh, that's brutal right there. That's a long that's flight. That's a long flight. A long flight. Yep. Uh, and as I mentioned, obviously, we know what happened in this country two days after um, that loss was was pretty awful. But um, that, was, that was not a fun time. But to your point, you know, uh, you can learn from these lopsided losses and um, – and you just you got to take it one game at a time. I, I, it's interesting because I heard Terry Fontenot this morning. He came and spoke to the school that my daughters go to, and he talked about staying in the moment. And it's interesting that he mentioned that because you can apply that in the game. Like that seems like it's a phrase, guys, that's thrown around all the time, right? Mm. Stay in the moment. Okay, yes, yeah, stay in the moment. I got it, coach. But like DJ, you talked about the formation issue in the red zone, right? If you stay in the moment – and focus on exactly what you have to do, that doesn't happen. Yeah. But if you start getting ahead of yourself, oh, this yeah. is my release on this play, or I got to block this guy, and you don't pay attention to the little things as far as just lining up, that can make a big difference in the complexion of a game. And coming away with a field goal when there should have been two touchdowns on those drives was pretty big. Um, so it's sometimes it's interesting with staying in the moment. Players need to do that. All right, let's th let's take a step back. We're gonna let's look at the NFL here because there was some interesting games throughout the course of week one. And, and Arch, I'm going to let you start. What was your biggest surprise of week one? I've got a couple that come right to the top of my mind, but I want to hear what yours is. Well, the Green Bay game certainly was one in Jacksonville where New Orleans was displaced because of Hurricane Ida. So they had been in Dallas practicing, and then they went over to Jacksonville, I don't know, a few days before to play this game. Jacksonville on the road in, at, at uh, Houston, so they had a chance to use that facility. Green Bay comes down, and there have been so much talk about Green Bay and, and, and Aaron Rodgers and the discourse between the, the front office Rodgers. and him and all that kind of stuff. But you knew that this team had been to back-to-back -back AFC Championship games and are an odds-on favorite to go back again this year. Yeah. And New Orleans, who took them apart a year ago, took them apart again. Jameis Winston threw the ball like nine times and threw five of them for touchdowns or whatever it was. He was outstanding. <laughs> Obviously, that's, that's the obvious one. I'm going to give you one that's a little bit more off the radar, though. I'm going to give you the, the win by the Arizona Cardinals against the Tennessee Titans. Titans team no longer with Arthur Smith as offensive coordinator, struggled on offense, uh, and this is a team that is very much the same team that was a playoff team a year ago. 
Kyler Murray in that uh, that group for Arizona and on the defense side, they took the Titans apart. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was a really impressive win for a team that I think a lot of people kind of fancy as a dark horse in the NFC in the Arizona Cardinals in a really tough NFC West. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I got a couple of them, and obviously that that Green Bay one was was mind boggling. The fact that if you went into that ball game and you said, "Hey, Jameis Winston will outdo Aaron Rodgers and." He will have the interceptions. I mean, Aaron Rodgers throwing interceptions in the red zone. That's just something he never does. To see that come out was uh, mind-boggling for sure. Uh, the one uh, the, that really comes to mind me is the game, as we record this, is it, it, Tuesday. Last night, uh, the game with the Raiders and Baltimore was pretty crazy. I mean, a lot of people talked about can Lamar take the next step. Would he be able to beat a team throwing the football? I did. It, I thought he did it both with his arms and his legs mm-hmm. in that ball game. Had a chance to win. I know he had a couple – Fumbles late in that ball game uh, to kind of help the Raiders get that win. But it was an unbelievable, I thought, performance for a guy who had just lost his top two backs coming into the first game of the season and uh, was able to, to, to kind of put that team on his back and give him a chance to, to win that ball game uh, w- w- was pretty spectacular for me. And the other one was uh, out in L.A., man, watching Stafford go against that Bears defense and kind of carve him up. Because I think a lot of people thought that Bears defense – would be one of the tops in the league. And he went out and threw for, you know, 303 touchdowns. And obviously that that connection with him and McVay is something that everybody's looking forward to watching. But I thought that the Bears' defense would hold up a little bit better, uh, to, you know, just because of how good they were supposed to be coming into that ball game. I mean, they still will be probably pretty good, but – that was an outstanding performance from from L.A. and the Rams. You see what he did there, Rack, is he went and found a bulldog yeah. quarterback. It just so out. happened. I don't know how that happened. How Unbelievable that? how yeah. that yeah. happens. At some point, it's coincidental. Full circle for the it's Georgia coincidental, Bulldogs. man. I don't know. It, it is. Hey, I will, to your point, though, DJ, I will tell you this past weekend I called the Ohio State-Oregon game, and the guy that I worked with, my play-by-play guy, was Dan Miller, who's the play-by-play guy for the Detroit Lions. Mm. So we started talking about – Uh, Matt Stafford a little bit and obviously him not being a part of the Lions and he was just telling me that how good Matt Stafford is but he never had a defense to help him out right it was just like he had to keep scoring points and scoring points and it was never enough because he didn't have a defense and now look he goes out and he gets one beast of a defense playing behind him and he's still playing at an extremely high level one other game that I thought was interesting I'll go really quick here was Houston and Jacksonville Not to say that Jacksonville should have won a game, right? (laughs) But the fact that they had the number one overall pick and Trevor Lawrence taking the field for the first time in an NFL uniform and the Houston Texans had a quarterback that was not named Deshaun Watson playing for them, and they still ended up throwing thirty, uh, throwing up 37 points. They're four for six in the red zone, so offense looked like it was still really good without Deshaun Watson playing that quarterback position. So the Houston Texans get off to a 1-0 and start Let's with not a victory talk about, over the Jackson. Uh, successful Jackson. red zones, Arch. Just, I mean, Rack, let's leave successful red zones out of this. I mean, come on, what are we oh, doing? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, somewhat of a short topic. <laughs> okay, so if that's the case, we got to talk about sore red zone. Okay, let's let's go back to the Falcons and let's spin this ahead. All right. So, what can the Falcons take away from this loss to get better and become a better team in Week Two, and Week Six, and Week Ten? DJ, I'm going to come back to you. And where do you feel like the future of this team looks like right now? Well, I think anytime you have a ball game in which we're you come in feeling good about yourself or you feel good about the product that's about to come on the field and you lose in the fashion that you do, it kind of refocuses you early. It gives you a different mindset going into week two that when you turn on that tape, that's something you don't ever want to see again. I mean, it's one of those things where if your little brother or your big brother is beating you up and uh, every day you come home, you, you find a way to say, hey, this not going to happen again. I think this is where the Falcons is after week one. You say, hey, let's go out and let's not make sure this occurrence is, is never put on tape again. Let's make sure that we're the more physical team. Let's make sure we're the team that's not having 13, 14 penalties in a ball game and we hurt ourselves. I think because this happens so soon, it happens so early, it gives guys a chance to see exactly where they are from Jump Street, and now you go into the next ball games feeling as, though, okay, I cannot make the same mistake twice. I can't go into the next ball game doing the same things I did because ultimately I saw what happened when that happened. You lose ball games. You hurt your team. You're not in position to win games. And we got to be honest, there's a lot of excitement around this team. 
We talked about Terry Fonda. We talked about Arthur Smith. We talked about some of the new faces. There are a lot of fans that are excited to see this ball club. There are a lot of people who expect big things to happen. And I still believe this can happen for this ball club, even though it's just week one. But putting that stuff on tape, it reminds you that that's something I don't want to see again because these guys have to uh, look at themselves in the mirror and say, hey, we can't allow this to happen again. Arch, same thing to you. Where do you see this team going in the next two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks as the 21, 2021 season continues to roll on? Yeah, I like him. I like him getting better, uh, Rack. I think that uh, there's a number of things you look at. Number one, the head football coach. I thought he was very introspective after the game. Talked about, okay, is my messaging correctly? Uh, am I coaching correctly? because of some of the occurrences that had maybe the procedural stuff is he coaching it I thought that was very uh, revealing very transparent for him to talk about that most coaches won't say anything about their scenario what they're trying to do I thought Arthur was very clear about that that hey I'm going to look at myself what do I need to do Uh, there's some play calls that I can go to he talked a lot about the last series of downs prior to the first half where Atlanta was backed up and was was trying to move the ball out run some clock maybe get a first down he got hamstrung because of a penalty. Could he have been more aggressive there? I thought he was very transparent about so maybe some of the things he could do a little bit better and a little bit different. Remember, he's still learning this roster as well. I, I think there's a growing period that has to go with the coaching staff as well to kind of know their personnel, maybe so, so know some of their weaknesses, what they can and can't get away with. Because let's face it, the the preseason was about trying to figure out who are your young guys and who's the depth on this team. What How does that look? Now we get into the nuts and bolts of the games. What can we can and can't we get away with with our 22 that's on the field or the the 28 guys that are on the field? And then when you look at what they did defensively, you're talking about a lot of times Dean Pease talks about pressuring the quarterback. They don't talk about sacks. Yeah, sacks are residual effect. You get the quarterback on the ground. This is probably as as elusive a quarterback as you're going to see all year long. Right. And he made you he made you pay for it. The guy this next weekend, he he's not going anywhere. Yeah. Now the ball's coming out, but that's where styles make fights. You could say, okay, you got the Super Bowl champs this weekend. We're going to get our rear ends kicked. Well, some of the blitzes that they came with and the pressures they came with, Brady's going to be on the ground with those. Unless Tampa makes an adjustment to try to block those, and then Dean Pease is going to have something else for it. I'm encouraged by that. Isaiah Oliver coming off the edge clean and Jalen Hurts steps around him, gets him outside, and throws the football for a 15-yard gain. Yeah. That ain't happening this weekend. Yeah. Okay, now Brady may get it out and get hit in the mouth. We'll have to wait and see. But if I'm on coverage, that may be going the other way. Those are the kind of things that I'm excited about. You had a special moment with a quarterback that had a special day. Now, is he a Pro Bowl or a Super Bowl champ? No, but I think he's a guy that has a chance to maybe make some da- do some damage in this league. You're not going to see that every weekend. And I'm not trying to make Jalen Hurts the next great quarterback, but he presented a problem that Atlanta couldn't solve. That problem doesn't exist this weekend. Hey, Rack, before you add, yeah. I want to add one more thing. Um, when Ars talked about Arthur Smith being a guy who owned up to some of the things that he wants to do better or how he can coach better, there's a flip side to it as well. All three of us have played in this league. All three of us have played – college ball at the end of the day when your coach puts together a plan it's on the players to go out and execute so I think a lot of this is let's go execute what the coach put in front of us you can go out and you can call all the plays you want or the coach can say he did this and that but at the end of the day there's no coach on the field it's those 11 guys and you got to go prove it to your other teammates that you can execute at a high level so I think all that comes down to it as well the players have to say hey we're going to get the job done and it's not all just on the coaches. we got to show up and do our job just as well. 100%. And, and the one thing I will tell you is when, when I was playing for Jim Moore, he used to always say, if you point the finger at somebody, there's three of them pointing back at yourself, yep. right? So to me, that's the same kind of deal as, as a player. You could sit there and try to point fingers of, well, this is why we didn't win. This is why we didn't score points. But there's three of them pointing back at yourself. Mm. What could you have done better to help this team end up winning? DJ, I'm going to come right back to you real quick. 30 seconds, all right? 30 seconds. Three, three. yeah. You guys right. talked about it. We got the GOAT this week. Falcons going on the road against Tom Brady. They're going to be playing with confidence. They got a big victory against the Cowboys on the previous Thursday night. I want you to give me one or two keys in 30 seconds or less that the Falcons need to do if they want to win that football game. Alignment and assignment. 
You got to get lined up and you got to do your job because at the end of the day, this is a team, especially on the offensive side of the ball, that has a bunch of weapons. And if you're not lined right, guess what? They're going to find that matchup. They're going to create some problems for you and you're going to be in trouble. And then you got to create some issues for Brady on the other side with as far as your, your assignment part of getting after people. And then on the defense side of the ball, we know how good they're supposed to be. You know, 22 guys coming back. Offensively, get a line. We saw this week you didn't get a line a couple times and you hurt yourself. Now go out and execute it and put the pressure on them. Everybody expects them to be the next great best or whatever it is. Put the pressure on them, man. You are just as talented as those guys. Go out and prove it. So, Arch, same thing. 30 seconds. What do the Falcons need to do to slow down the Bucks? I would say eliminate negative plays. Stay, stay, in, stay in front of the chains the best you can, uh, and that's easier said than done. These guys are going to make some plays, but limit those. And maybe more importantly, if you go back to the December game, Atlanta lost to Tampa 31-27 in our building. They had one explosive play in the first half. They trailed 17 to nothing at halftime. They had nine explosive plays in the second half. That's 15 yards, 10, 15 yards or more, and they won the football game 31-27. Defensively, limit the explosive plays. That's what Tampa lives on are the big play. You know, it's so interesting. You and I are on the same wave like Dave because I was going to say defensively, they have to tackle because if there's one thing – Tom Brady's getting that ball out, okay? Mm -hmm. He's not going to hold on to it. He's going to put it in the hands of a receiver, get them down on the ground because you miss the tackles, and that's when those explosive plays come. So tackling, getting those guys down on the ground, I think is going to be key to slowing down the Tampa Bay Bucs. All right, Atlanta Falcons end up dropping dropping their opening week matchup against the Philadelphia Eagles 32-6. to We broke it down for you here. Guess what? We'll be right back here next week to break down the Falcons game against the Buccaneers. Dave Archer, DJ Shockley, great job as always. Appreciate your insight. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We'll see you back here in one week. Enjoy the game this weekend, everybody. Take care. There's not another bulldog you want to talk about? Uh, Let me think about it. Let me think about it one more time. You're listening to Falcons Audible presented by AT&T.